Okay. Good morning, all like 11 or 12 of you. <laughs> Thanks for braving the rain to be here this morning. Welcome to Aviana Baptist Church. And uh, you, already, you already know the drill, so let's start this thing. <coughs> Open our eyes, Lord, let us see all that you are, all that you mean. Open our ears, Lord, let us hear all that you are, be loud and clear. Please be near. As our praises rise, may your presence fall. Heaven, heaven fall down. Spirit, spirit pour out on us all now. Heaven fall down. Come, Jesus, come, come like the wind. Fill up this place, we welcome you in. Come, Jesus, come, come like the rain. Open the skies, show us your face. Oh, Lord, we wait as our praises rise. Join me in a word of prayer this morning. And Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, that you promised to inhabit the praise of your people. And so you promised to be here this morning. And Lord, as that we just sang in that song, we welcome you into this place. Father, would you just rain down with your Holy Spirit on us? And Father, we pray for our services here this morning. Lord, that they would just, everything that we do here, put a smile on your face. What's happening in children's ministry, us, our worship through song, our worship through giving, our worshiping through your word, our response to you. Father, would you just be pleased with all of it? And Father, we do want to pray as this weather is, is just bad. Lord, we just pray that you would just keep your hand of protection on, on folks. Lord, we want to pray for those people in Venice as they're dealing with this horrible, horrible flooding. And Father, we just pray for your safety, for your, your presence, Father, for your hand to be on them. And Lord, we continue to pray for our deployed families, those that are, that are deployed, the service members, and pray that you'd sustain them and carry them and help them to lean in you during that time. And for the families that are left behind, Lord, that they would just know your peace, know your presence, Father. And Lord, we just love you and praise you and give you free reign in this place this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, welcome to Aviano Baptist Church. My name is Barry Cole. I'm the pastor here. We're glad you're here this morning. Glad you braved the weather as massive, braved this rain to come on out and, and join us this morning. Chelsea, can you turn me down just a little bit? This mic is super, super hot this morning. Uh, we're glad you're here this morning. And, and I just I, what, what I hope you'll find here in Aviano Baptist is that we are a church that where you have been is not really all that relevant, but where you're going in your walk with the Lord is what we're more concerned about. And we want to help you connect. We want to come alongside you, help you grow in your relationship with Christ and see the difference that he can make in your life so that he can send you out, both here in the Alviano community and wherever it is that he takes you after this. Um, I do hope, if, if this is your first time with us this morning, a very special welcome to you. I hope you got one of these when you came in. Um, inside this welcome envelope, which is some flyers and stuff about ministries, we have ways you can be connected and ways you can grow in your relationship with Christ. And, and even for folks that have been here a while, if you just want to refresh that, this is version 12.0 or something. So if you got one six months ago and you want to get another one to see what's going on now, um, look through that and just grab it on the way out. Um, is, if this is your first time with us, I, the other thing I'll ask you to do Oh, that's a big flash of lightning. The other thing I'll ask you to do is to fill out this little slip that says, tell us about yourself. And just take a moment, help us get to know you a little bit better. Um, that's perforated, so tear it off, throw it in the offering plate as it goes by a little bit later. On the back of it, it says prayer requests, and that's for everybody. Uh, first time guests, uh, regular attenders, members. And so if there's any way that we can be praying for you specifically, minister to your family specifically, would you jot that on there? Put your contact information on the front so we know who we're praying about. Um, and then you, you too, throw that in the offering plate as it goes by. We have a team of prayer warriors. We have, I share those with the deacons. I pray over those. And so let us know how we can be praying for you, how we can minister to you. Okay, let me ask you to join me back of the bulletin, the announcement section. Let me draw your attention to a few things that are going on. Uh, lots of things in there, especially as the holiday season comes up. There's lots and lots more stuff happening. So um, we'll just spend a few minutes talking about those. The Moldova mission team meeting will be today after the second service. And so if you have expressed interest in going on that trip, um, we're getting closer to the point of asking for commitments or, or trying to have folks make commitments to be a part of that team. So join us after the second service. If you, if you weren't here when we had our first meeting and you want some more information, join us downstairs. We'll be in the fellowship hall. Take about 30 minutes, maybe. Um, we'll just go through some of the things that are happening um, there on the Moldova mission trip, 17 to 24 February. Those are the dates of the trip, so check your calendar if you're interested in that. Um, join us today downstairs after the second service. Ladies and Fellowship Together Lift is coming up on the 21st at 6.30. It's an easy as pie social and craft night. So what that means is bring a pie. Those pies are going to be taken to folks that are in TLF and are going to be there over Thanksgiving. So they don't have to sit there and just eat, you know, store-bought stuff or whatever. Um, so bring a pie in a tin you don't want back because you're probably not going to get it back. Um, but that's, that's the intent for that night. Be making a craft as well. Um, Wendy Neptune is the point of contact and her email address is there in the bulletin. Men's dinner will be the following night, Friday, the 22nd at 6 o'clock. Uh, guys will just come together. We have a time of eating because we're Baptist guys, and that's what we do. We'll have a time of eating. We'll have a time of getting in the Word of God. We are studying through Tony Evans' study on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So if you want to join us for that, 6 o'clock uh, Friday night downstairs in the Fellowship Hall where we meet Renee Matt Raffimo, one of our deacons, also our men's ministry coordinator, is a POC, and his email is there in the bulletin. The Wyvern Wonderland Base Outreach coming up on the 6th of December. That's sort of the Christmas thing on base, the Christmas tree lighting, uh, the little Christmas village, we'll call it on base for lack of a better term. Uh, where we are with that is we ask, we ask for commercial sponsorship. Um, base Legal initially said no, but we're working with them. We think we're moving them in the direction of them saying yes. So we're going to keep it in the bulletin. You continue to pray with us about that. I'm going to talk with Legal tomorrow and make sure that we, are, we have all the permissions and all that lined up. For us to do that so you continue to pray about that so we can have an opportunity just to touch base and connect with folks this is a great opportunity for us to just get out there and and, and make, make some connections in the community so 6 december that's when that is and and as soon as we have formal approval we're going to put the sign up sheet up there on facebook um, and so that you can start sign up for shifts Christmas Eve services, these are out on the connection point in the Welcome Center. An invitation to our Christmas Eve services. We're going to have three of them, 3 o'clock, 4.15, 5.30. Um, and so take these and, and invite friends. Invite your friends and neighbors. That People will come to church on Christmas. Sometimes they may not darken the door of a church any other time during the year, but they'll come at Christmas and they'll come at Easter. So take these and hand them out to folks, your friends and coworkers that you know that don't attend church anywhere, that need to hear the gospel. And bring them on Christmas Eve. You make plans to attend one of those services. It'll be a candlelight service. We'll end the service with some candlelight singing a silent night. And so it'll be just a great time for us to get together um, <clears throat> and to celebrate our Lord's birth. 
Uh, deployed family members, we've mentioned this for a couple weeks. The last, last week we'll mention it. I think I've got a good list of all the deployed members and the deployed spouses, but if your spouse is deployed or is deploying soon, would you make sure you tell me that so I can make sure we have that contact information on the list? We're trying to be very intentional about keeping connection with the spouses, but also keeping connection with the deployed members while they're, while they're gone, especially over the holidays, but we're trying to be very, much more intentional about that, so let me know that. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is we are looking to start a, a home group in the Sechile area. And so if you are interested in being a part of that, hosting it and or leading it, would you come let me know that um, so we can start to build a group for that for that Sechile home group? We have a lot of people that live in that neck of the woods. Um, and so we're looking to have home group Bible study start in that area. So as always, lots of stuff going on. If you didn't grab a bulletin, grab it on the way out so you can you can keep track of all the things that are happening. We're absolutely glad that you're here this morning, that we have an opportunity to worship together. So as we continue in our time of worship, let's just stand and take a moment to greet one another this morning. All right, please stand and worship with us again. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above 
every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. So real quick, I just want to say, with the, the lightning and thunder outside, it might be uh, kind of distracting, you know, because it is really loud, but I was just thinking while we were singing that song how we should take advantage of, that, of those moments and think, like, what an awesome God we serve, right? Because, like, he can shake the world, right, just with the thunder that he's created. And so I think it's actually kind of a cool, kind of a cool atmosphere, right? <laughs> just have a little unplugged coffee shop <laughs> get out our phones and you know do one of these things <clears throat> He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down, and every chain will break, as broken hearts declare his praise, for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah, he's roaring with power. Fighting our battles, every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him.
to open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Ushers, please come forward and receive the offering. You may be seated. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but i know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are 
who you are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love La la love, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Wait a minute. Thank you, praise team. Little Briar back there, praising the Lord. I love to hear that. She, she, you didn't see her earlier. Almost as soon as the praise team started practicing, she was in here, started raising her hand. Just, it's amazing to see her just back there, listening to her worshiping back there. You know, we've had a lot of babies uh, in our congregation this past year. A lot. I've lost count of how many babies. Just another one born Friday night. Annika Hedrick and her husband Brigham just had their baby Friday night. So lots of babies being born. We've had lots of them. And, and moms, only you know this. Dads, we can't really know this. Moms, only you know this, that, that toward the end of your time, toward the egg, end of the pregnancy, this thought sets in. I just want this child out, right? And, and, and it doesn't matter how many weeks along you are, there comes a point in time when that thought settles in. I just want this child out. And then the big day comes, right? And, and, that, and that day, and, and the labor is incredible pain, I'm told. I've got no personal experience, incredible pain. And guys, again, this is something moms only know. Dads, this is all we can do. Just nod and look sympathetic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's all we got. That's all we can do. That day comes and the labor is incredible. The pain is incredible. And it seems like it'll never end. But then you hold that baby. Then, then that little one is born and you look in that beautiful little face and something happens at that moment. You forget all of that, right? You forget all of that, that waiting to say, I just want it to end even the pain, you forget that. And everything about that little baby is perfect, right, at that moment, including the timing. And, you know, there's something similar in our, in our walk with the Lord. There are times of incre incredible pain and incredible difficulty. And, and we cry out to God. We say, when is this going to end? I just want this over, right? There's some times that are, that are like that. And then one day it ends. It will. It will end, and it, it does. And if you are in one of those times right now where you are in the deepest, darkest valley, it does end. That time comes. And when that time comes, you have a similar thought as the mom. You forget all of that. All of that, all of that waiting for it, it to be over, wondering where God is. Why aren't you ending this? You forget all of that, and you realize that his timing was perfect. And you realize that how he revealed himself to you during that time, during that walk in the valley, that how he revealed himself to you was really what you needed most. Well, that's kind of where we are this morning. John chapter 11, that's where we are today. Take out your Bibles, turn there with me. If you don't have a Bible with you, 
Uh, there should be one under one of the seats in front of you, so feel free to take that out and use it today if you need it. Um, if you don't have a Bible at all at home and you've been thinking, boy, I really probably ought to get me one, feel free to take that with you and use it. Um, if you are joining us via version, just go ahead and log in. You'll find our event there. The text for today, John chapter 11, is already uploaded in there. John chapter 11 is where we're going to be this morning. One more miracle of Jesus, when he, that time when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and maybe you're familiar with the story. Mary and Martha and Lazarus were all good friends of Jesus. You remember that? There's that account in the Gospels where, where Jesus visits their home. And, and Martha, she's up flitting about, doing all manner of things. And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning. And there's that little sibling spat that goes on while Jesus is there. I don't know how many times he's, he visited their home. But he was close, close friends with them. And Jesus finds out that Lazarus, their brother, is sick. And he, de he delays in coming, purposely delays in coming, and Lazarus dies. And the siblings must have been close. Mary and Martha are absolutely crushed by all of it. And Jesus shows up, and he, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. And that's not really the, the main event of the story. This miracle hinges on two things, not so much the raising of Lazarus, although that's the thing that we notice most, right? That's sort of the thing that stands out, raising somebody from the dead gets your attention. But this miracle hinges on two things, God's timing. Why did he delay in the first place? Why didn't he come right away? Why didn't he show up knowing what was happening, know he, knowing what he could have prevented? His timing, it hinges on that and how he uses that to reveal more of himself. That's what this miracle hinges on. Now, I'm not going to put up the entire text today. We've got a lot of verses to cover, verses 17 through 44. And there's a lot of stuff in there. So I want us to take it in chunks, and we'll take it in some smaller chunks so that we can kind of really mine some of those truths out of it to see what God's timing and why he, why he decided to do it the way he did and how he revealed himself through that. But here's our big idea this morning, that God shows his love for us not by sparing us suffering and heartache. Listen, if you have lived just one day as an adult in this world especially, you know that, that, that suffering and heartache is part of the deal. Life in this world, in this fallen, sinful world, there will be heartache. Jesus promised that. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. It's, it's the, the consequences of living in a sinful, fallen world. There is suffering, there is heartache. And God shows his love for us, not by sparing us all of that, but by working in it and using it to reveal more of himself in the midst of it. That's the big idea when we look at this passage, this, this raising of Lazarus from the dead. This is the point of the story, I think. And so I want us to see how Jesus does that. The first way he shows himself, reveals himself to them, is he shows his love by showing himself, just revealing more of who he is. Let's pick up there John chapter 11 in verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at home, sort of indicative of their personality, that same thing we saw when Jesus visited their house. And Jesus said, oh, let me, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself there. But Mary stayed at the house, verse 21. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Jesus shows up. There's something significant about this story. He shows up, but, but he's late. He delays in coming. When he's told about Lazarus being sick, he purposely makes a decision at that point to delay in coming. And, and, he, and he shows up, and, and the reason he delays seems a little odd at first. I'm going to ask you to flip back in John chapter 11, back up there to verse 5. And it, it gives an, an insight as to why Jesus delayed in the first place. To us, when we first read it, it seems a little odd. This doesn't seem to connect. Verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place that he was. 
Did you catch that? The reason why he delayed? He, he, he finds out that Lazarus was sick. And it says in verse 5 that he loved them. And so, verse 6, therefore, because of that, there's the reason he delayed. He delayed because he loved them. And that seems odd at first, right? If he truly loved them, why wouldn't he come right away? Lazarus was sick. He knew the extent of it. They wouldn't have brought it to him if he just had a little cold. Why wouldn't he come right away? It seems almost like an odd thing. He delays because he loves them. And his delay was intentional so that he could reveal more of himself in the midst of it. Just pop back up to verse 4. But when Jesus heard this, that Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness will not end in death. He would die, but that's not the whole point of it. This sickness will not end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified in it. There we go. I'll just read. We'll just let, let, just let you read the whole thing back there. It'll be all right. <laughs> he delays on purpose. Because the greatest thing that he can do for them is not to spare Lazarus from this sickness, but to reveal more of himself in the midst of it. Because he loved them, that's why he delayed. He was intentional, so he could reveal more of himself. And you say, well, how can that possibly be love? I mean, when we're in the middle of that, right, that's not the question that we ask. That's not what we say we want. In fact, that's not even the, the question Martha asked. Lord, where were you, right? Why didn't you come? We say, how could that possibly be love, delaying like that? Knowing full well what was going to happen, how can that possibly be love? How could he let them go through that? John's gospel begins with this, John chapter 1, verses 14 through 16 of John chapter 1, he said this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then he said this in verse 16, for of His fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. In other words, Jesus reveals to us the glory of God. When He came, when He made His, His dwelling among us, He reveals to us the glory of God. And we embrace it. And we accept it. And as we do, we find grace. That's how we receive grace. The more glory he reveals, the more grace we find. And the Hebrew writer said this, Hebrews chapter 4, that his grace is what we need in times of trouble. Now, we often think we know what we need in times of trouble. Lord, what I need is for you to show up and heal my brother. That's what I think I need, what we really need. The word of God says we really need in time of trouble is his grace. A deeper understanding, him giving us divine help that we cannot possibly even earn. That's what grace means. That's what we need in those times. Jesus delays on purpose so that they can experience more of his grace. And Martha doesn't quite get that. Verse 21, she asks, asks that question that all of us would have asked. That makes that statement, Lord, if you had just been here, then my brother wouldn't have died. She makes that very normal, natural reaction. She doesn't quite get what it is that he's doing. And so he helps her connect her faith to her life. It's one thing to believe. It's another thing to live it, right? We have, we we're told all of these things about Christ so that we can live it out. He helps her connect her faith to her life. And he reveals more of himself, not just by delaying, so that they could come to know him in a deeper way, come to experience his grace. He reveals more of himself by the truth. She's got a pretty good understanding, a pretty good theological base. She says in, in verse 24, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She's got pretty good end time theology. She's got a pretty good base of understanding. But he builds on that. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He brings her back to the truth of who he is. That's how he helps her to see this, helps her connect it. I'm reading a book called Healing Your Marriage When Trust is Broken. I've been reading it for a while. It's not a very long book, but I'm not a very fast reader, and I put it on the shelf for a while and set it there. I'm not reading this book because that's the reality in our marriage. I'm reading this book because I realize, and, and I've come to the, to the understanding that it is in a lot of people's marriage, that they're dealing with issues, either the effect of pornography in their marriage or the effect of infidelity. A lot of marriages are dealing with that, and I'm reading this book so that I can be better equipped to help if, if you need it. But this is something she said in that book, the author. She said, at times you truly do feel like you're out at sea without a paddle, right? That's where, that's where they were. Martha's grasping at straws. Lord, if you had just been here, she feels like she's drifting along. 
out at sea without a paddle. And she said, wisdom from godly people will help you stay afloat. But listen, it will be the truth of God's word that carries you to solid ground. That's what Jesus brings her back to. The truth of who he is brings her back to the truth of his word. That's the solid ground that she needs, not not necessarily the advice of godly people. And that's what we need in those times. Not platitudes, right? Not bumper sticker faith kind of statements. That's not what we need in those times. We need the solid foundation of what is true. The solid foundation of what is unchanging, that's what helps us understand more of who God is. That's what helps us to see deeper what He's doing in those moments. And then we come to learn something else. Last part of verse 25. He says, He who believes in me will live even if he dies. That's for Lazarus, right? He will live even if he dies. And then verse 26. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's for Martha. And we come to learn something deeper. He comes to show her something much deeper in that moment, and that is there is not one second, either in life or in death, either this side of the grave or beyond it, there is not one second that you will ever be separated from the love of God. It's the same thing Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. He said, neither life nor death, nor angels nor demons, and he he goes through this whole litany of things. And then in case he forgot something, he he just throws this phrase in at the end, or any other thing shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. There is not one second when you are a child of God, not one second. We may not always recognize that. We may not always realize that it was a truth that he had to bring Martha to understand. It's a truth he has to bring us to understand. Because when we're in the valley and when it is dark, we're tempted to question that and say, why weren't you here? Where were you in this moment? You abandoned me. That's the temptation. And we have to come back to the truth and say there won't be one second, not this side of eternity, not the other side of eternity, that will ever be separated from the love of God. By the way, there is a note-taking guide. I failed to mention this last week, too. There is a note-taking guide in your bulletin. If you're, if you're new with us this morning, there is a note-taking guide there in the bulletin if you want to use it. It's also a downloadable version um, on the U version. So if, you, if you're using that, you can just click on that, a downloadable version. And it is on our website every week. If you want to download it, put it on your device and take notes that way. That's what these fill-in-the-blanks are all about. If you want to follow along in the note-taking guide, there also is a stink bug on the pulpit up here. So I'm trying desperately to shoo him away without killing him and making the whole sanctuary smell terrible. Jesus comes to them. The first, very first thing he does, though, in, in the midst of all of this, he delays on purpose because there are some powerful, powerful truths that he wants to teach them. Listen, don't measure the love of God for you by how much health he brings into your life. Don't measure his love for you by how much wealth he brings into your life or even how much comfort you feel at the hard times. Don't measure God's love for you by those things. That's a popular message today, but it's a misguided truth. It's a misguided measure. If we measure our love by those things, how much health he brings, how much wealth he brings, how much comfort we have in our lives, then we have to really step back and question, say, how did he feel about Paul? Paul didn't have a lot of those things in his life. We have to question, how did he really feel about Jesus? Jesus didn't have a lot of those things in his life. We can't measure God's love for us by those things. Here's what we can measure God's love by by how much of himself he gives you to know and enjoy. Listen, sometimes it's in these dark moments when everything else is stripped away. And like that author said, we feel like we're out in the, in the lake and we're just drifting. It's often only in those moments that we'll realize that. He delays in coming for a reason. He shows love by showing himself. And secondly, this, he shows love by showing up. He, he just comes. He arrives. They think he's too late. Four four days into this, they think he's too late. He's not, but they think he is. He shows up and he comes to them physically. That's the first thing he does. He just comes alongside them and comes to them where they are. Martha seeks him out in verse 20. Mary seeks him out in verse 29. And, And he's there for them. I think that's an important point to not miss in this story. He doesn't just show them from afar and and allow that situation to help them realize who he is. He shows up. He's there. And there's something special about that. This nasty storm that we have this morning started last night. 
I know that because this incredible clap of thunder hit at 4 o'clock this morning and woke me up. So I know this storm started last night. And you know when that happens, if you've got small children especially, when a thunderstorm like this comes and it rattles the windows in your house, they'll climb, come and climb in bed with you, right? They, our girls did that, and we have three girls, and so you can imagine when there was a thunderstorm, there were arms and legs all over the place, and there was no room in the bed for mom and dad. But they'll come and they'll climb in the bed with you. And you're not going to make the thunder and lightning go away. That's not why they're there. That's not why they came in the room. They don't really expect you to make the thunder and the lightning go away. That's not what they're there for. But there's something special about just you being there, that they're with you. And in the midst of this, Jesus shows up. He's just there. He, he's there with them. The psalmist said this, the Lord is near to all who call on him. Listen, when we call on him, when we have these tough moments, there, there's a, a truth in his word that he'll show up. He's not distant. He's not far off. He's right there with us. He'll be near to those who call on him. He's not only with them physically, he's with them emotionally. Look at verse 33. Now, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, he's talking about Mary, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. In verse 35, Jesus wept. And so the Jews who were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who have opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and the stone was lying against it. He's, he's with them emotionally. Verse 35 there, the shortest verse in the Bible, but, but a powerful, powerful truth. He weeps with them in the moment. Now, there's been a lot of discussion, commentaries and all that have a lot of discussion, a lot of speculation about why he reacted that way. Was he reacting purely to the emotion of the moment? Was he reacting to the, to the fact that there was disbelief? Was, how was he reacting to that? Why did he weep there in verse 35? A lot of speculation about that. But I think it was genuine compassion on his part. These were, these were close, close friends of his. I saw a meme shared on Facebook just this past week or maybe it was a week before. It was talking about this story. And it said, just because you know how the story ends doesn't mean you can't cry at the sad parts. And I thought, exactly right. He comes to this moment, I think it's genuine compassion. Lazarus was a close friend. Yes, Jesus knew what he was going to do, but it was a close friend. He saw Mary and Martha, his close friends. He saw them in deep, deep grief. He couldn't help but to be affected by that. He was, he was showing compassion for them. Romans 12, Paul said, weep with those who weep. Listen, God wouldn't have told us that if he doesn't first lead us in it, if he doesn't do that with us. He was with them emotionally. And there's something significant about that. He's not distant from us in our pain. Right? That's sometimes we think that. When we're in a moment like this, we think God's way off. God's distant. He's not distant from us in our pain. But I think it's more than that. Twice we're told in this passage he's deeply moved. Not just we're told in verse 35 that he wept, but we're told twice he's deeply moved. It's a phrase in English. It's one word in Greek. And it means inner pain, turmoil. But it also means this. It means anger. It means indignant. There was the compassion of the moment where he wept with those who wept. He mourned with those who mourned. But there was also another aspect to this. This indignance, this anger almost. The only times we're told that, the, the two times we're told of verse 33 and verse 38, both times a response to their question. Where were you when we needed you? And Jesus responds this way, deeply moved, almost indignant. You know, the Greeks and the pagans had a, a word to describe their gods. And the Greek word was this, apatheai. Now, you can hear the English word we get out of that, apathetic. And if you, read, if you read any Greek mythology, you get that sense. The, the gods of Greek mythology, they were apathetic to what was going on in the world around them, what was going on in the lives of the people. They didn't care. They were completely disconnected. That's how they described their gods. And so it's one thing for, for the Jews to question Jesus, for the, for the Greeks that might have been there to question Jesus and say, why weren't you here? It's one thing for them to question him. They didn't know him, but his close friends. 
Mary and Martha, when they questioned him, why weren't you here when we needed you? There's this reaction on Jesus' part. The psalmist said, I walk, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. And here God is in the flesh incarnate before them. And that same promise that the psalmist lived out, that the psalmist talked about and pointed out, they had seen it. They had seen him do it. And there's this response from him to say, when you, do you even know me? There was a, a hurt that went deep as they responded that way. And they assumed he wasn't there. But in reality, he was always with them. He was always with them. Let me, let, me, let me explain what I mean. Jump back again to the beginning of John chapter 11, verse 3. There in verse 3 of chapter 11, the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So there Jesus finds out that Lazarus is sick. And he says to the disciples, we're going to delay. We're not going to go right away. And then just at the right time, over in verse 11, just as the right, at the right time, he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. It's time for us to go. And the disciples take that very literally. They say, well, if he's asleep, then he'll be fine. He'll recover. He'll wake up all as well. And then look at verse 14. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, what's significant about that is nobody told him that. Nobody told him that. That messenger that came and told him that Lazarus was sick, either he was still there there were, there were no email in those days. There were no text messages. He couldn't get updates from back where Mary and Martha were. That messenger was either still there or he had turned around and returned to the village. Jesus never got an update on Lazarus' condition, but he knew. He knew. He knew exactly what would happen. His, this sickness had progressed to the point where Lazarus passed away. Nobody clued him into that, but he knew. His finger was on the pulse of that situation the entire time. Same way he responded to the disciples. You remember in Mark chapter 6, that time when he, when he walked on the water. We saw that miracle several weeks ago. And Mark's account of that, Mark chapter 6, said that Jesus was up on the mountain, but he saw the disciples. They were rowing against the wind. He saw it. He never took his eyes off them. He knew exactly what was going on. His finger was on the pulse of that situation the entire time. It's what the Hebrew writer tells us, reminds us in Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. That's his promise. And Jesus reveals himself, reveals the, the glory of God in this, not just by showing them more of himself, he shows up and reveals the glory of God. And the last thing is he shows his love by showing out. I didn't really like that heading, showing out, but it had to fit the rest of my I had the voice of my preaching professor in my head. It helps them understand. It helps them remember it if you make them all sound similar. And I couldn't think of a better way to say it, but he shows that he does something. He's not just there standing off on the side saying, boy, I hope you get that, get that figured out. He shows up and he does something. Verse 39, Jesus said, remove the stone. The, the time for talk is done. It's now it's time for action. Now there's something to be done. The timing of all of this is significant. The, the Jewish rabbis taught that, that after three days, the soul of a, body would re, of a dead body would return to God. After four days, there was no hope. The timing of this is significant. He shows up after four days and he says, roll the stone away. Well, that explains why Martha reacted the way she did. She said, now, Lord, the, there will be, after all this time, there will be a stench. He's been dead four days. Listen, the, the soul is gone. This is beyond hope. He says, move the stone. Jesus is not just a doctrine. He's not just things that we need to know about him. He's not just a feeling. He's not just emotion in our lives. He's real, and he's active in our lives. It's not just about learning things, learning things about this guy who lived a long time ago from an old book. Our, our relationship with Christ is not just about that. Listen, we come to those critical junctures of our lives, historical facts about somebody who lived a long time ago don't do us a whole lot of good. It's not just about knowing things. He's not just a doctrine, not just a set of beliefs. And it's not just about emotion. He connected with them emotionally. He was there with them emotionally, but it's not just about that. 
our relationship with him has an emotional aspect. But listen, you, you, we all know this. Our emotions are too easily manipulated. They're too easily impacted and affected by the things that go on around us. They're a very bad judge of how things are really going in our lives. He's real. He shows up and he, and he acts in the moment to remind him. There's a very real relationship that they have with him. That's what he said in John chapter 5. He said, I'm at work. My father's at work. Even up till now, I'm at work in your lives. He's real and he's active. He shows up and he does something. And he raises Lazarus because he is the resurrection. That's the, that's the point where this whole story is driving. Ultimately, what he wants to reveal about himself is he is the resurrection. He is the life. Now, I read a lot of things about just what that means. I mean, that's a, that's a good statement. I could just, a pastor, I could just throw that out there, and you probably all would nod and say amen. And I read a lot of things about what that means. What are we to take away from that, that he is the resurrection, he is the life? And I read a lot of stuff, a lot of different ideas about what that means. But I finally settled on this. To resurrect something, what does that mean? To resurrect something means to restore it to its previous state. Right? That's what it means to resurrect something. You resurrect a, a dead person, in this case, like he did. You're restoring Lazarus to his previous state. If you're at work and a project has been killed, and they say, all right, you're going to resurrect that project, right? You're restoring it to its previous state. That's what it means to resurrect. And in Jesus is life, restored to its previous state. That's what he means, I am the resurrection and the life. The way it was in the beginning. Perfect and eternal harmony and fellowship with God. That's where he's driving. That's the point he wants to bring them to, to realize that's who he is. Raising Lazarus wasn't about ending the pain. Oh, he would one day die again. They all would. He would one day pass away again. It wasn't about ending the pain. It was a visible lesson of some powerful truths about Jesus. That his love is unquestionable. Even when the circumstances whisper in our ear something, something different, His love is unquestionable. His timing is perfect. Even when we think He's late, even when we think He's past and He's overdue, His timing is perfect. His work is unending. He's at work up to now. When He said it here in John chapter 5 and today, He's at work up to now. His work is unending. And He is the resurrection. He is the life. He said to Martha, do you believe that? Do you believe that? And we're told as this story concludes that even many of the Jews that just a moment ago had questioned him, questioned his love, questioned who he was, questioned if he even cared about him, just a few moments later said many of them came to believe as a result of this event. Maybe that's the question he's asking you. Do you believe? Do you believe these things? Do you believe I am who my word reveals me to be? God invaded human history in Jesus Christ, intersected and crossed and came and became one of us, invaded human history so that you and I could experience life as it was intended to be, as it was designed, forgiven and free, perfect fellowship with God. The Bible looks at the response of those in the crowd and said, many believe. Let me, let me end with this question for you this morning. What about you? What will your response be? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you. Thank you for your love for us that's unquestionable. We see it over and over and over again in the pages of Scripture. Thank you for your love for us that is absolutely unquestionable, absolutely unending. That you loved us so much, Lord, that you didn't even spare your own son so that we might be reunited to you. And Father, thank you that, that you're not, you don't just love us from afar. You came to make your dwelling among us. You come to us in moments and stand with us. You connect with us emotionally. Thank you for who you are. You did all of this, came to this earth and died on a cross that we might realize that you are the resurrection and the life. We can have our sins forgiven. We can spend eternity in heaven with you. Perfect, eternal, unending fellowship with you. 
And Father, as we sing this last worship song, we think about the words of praise to you. Father, would you continue to speak to our hearts? Continue to to fertilize and grow the seeds of the word that you have just planted, Father. Continue to lead us in these next moments, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, stand with us as we sing our closing worship song.
salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee praise and honor unto thee i want to end our time this morning just with the thought of the, the words of that song just ringing in our head. If you need to talk with someone, pray with someone after the service, I'll be available to do that. Join me in prayer this morning. Father, thank you that you loved us enough to go to that rugged cross, to be our salvation for us, to pay for our sins. You love us enough that you don't abandon us in difficulty. You're there with us always. And even when we don't know it, even when we don't feel it, we don't sense it, you never, we never are out of your sight. Father, thank you for your incredible unending, almost incomprehensible love. And Father, we pray as we go out from this place and we'll experience challenges even coming this week. Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to rely on the truth of who you are, that you're always walking there right beside us. We pray in Jesus' name. Open our eyes, Lord, let us see all that you are, all that you mean. Open our ears, Lord, let us hear all that you are, be loud and clear. Please be near.